All righty, welcome everybody to the travel information meeting of February 2020. Excited to have you all. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to start today with our travel services updates, um, which will be presenters today will be myself and April. Um, Teresa will be presenting in the, the in-person, so, so we had her on there. Uh, but for today, it'll be uh, for the remote session, it'll be myself and April. All righty. So first announcement um, that we had in the preliminary agenda is um, an announcement regarding travel services and PCS. Um, PCS is short for Procurement Customer Service, which I'm sure many of you are working with already. And so what the update is, is so Teresa Athen, so that's um, um, our current you know, travel services program manager. Um, she is now taking on uh, the procurement customer service team. So she will be both managing travel services as well as um, customer engagement. So the procurement customer service team is actually going to be changing their name to customer engagement. So if you start to, to hear that floating around, um, just know that that is the same as procurement customer service. Uh, let me pull up the chat just so I have it. Um, and just so you know, procedurally, there will be no change. So um, procurement questions are still going to go to, to PCS Health. Um, travel questions are still going to come to us. Um, just know that there's just going to be some, a little bit of reorg and some shifting in, you know, who's managing the program and things like that. Um, this may result in some change coming, changes coming up in the future. Um, but just know procedurally, um, you will just be doing everything that you're the same um, as today. Um, another thing to announce regarding that is if you have any topics related to procurement that you would like to be presented in any future procurement forums, um, please submit them to customer engagement, so to pcshelp at uw.edu. Um, it's possible that we may, you know, combine the forum um, into one in the future, or they may be separate. Um, that's still under uh, discussion. Um, but they wanted to let us know that if you do have any topics, um, there will be they will be planning one. So make sure if you have anything that you know you would like to have discussed at that that you submit that to the the PCS team. All right. And so kind of over the past year, I've mentioned that we would be updating our MPO spreadsheet. Um, MPO is short for Meals Paid for Others. So we've kind of had the, the same spreadsheet. Um, for a few years now um, and realize that we definitely need to, to make some updates to it um, just to make the, the procedure with, with following it a little bit more clear um, and things like that. Also, there was kind of some known issues with the way it was calculating things um, for foreign travel. It wasn't uh, rounding properly and things like that. So um, it's just been in need of a, a rework just to give you a little background on, on where we're at with that. Um, it is not final, it is still being drafted, but we just kind of wanted to give you a first glance of sort of what our idea is with it. Uh, we will be releasing a survey tomorrow to gather some feedback. It's going to be a very short survey, um, probably just a couple sort of yes and no questions. Um, there's another column that we're considering adding to the spreadsheet. And so we wanted to kind of get your, your feedback on whether you think that uh, would be helpful or if it just makes the spreadsheet a little bit um, too complicated kind of thing. So we want to um, get, your, get your feedback on that. Uh, but I figured I'd sort of give you a glance at sort of kind of how it's going now. So that way, when you, when you get to the survey, you can kind of understand kind of what our vision is with it and then uh, respond accordingly. So one thing that's kind of different with the, the way that we're approaching the guidance on this, um, that's been different kind of what than what's been floating around over the past few years. The main thing is the way that it kind of gets entered into Ariba. So what people are generally doing right now is they are including, what they're doing is giving the traveler their per diem um, for that meal. So the person who actually paid the meal for somebody else. So we're um, essentially, we're, we're giving them that per diem and then the rest is bidding um, that's compliant, you know, and within per diem for the pool of the participants is then being put on the meals paid for others line item. We're kind of shifting it to be just a little bit different. It's still the same compliance. There's no change in like what the rules are and how you stay compliant, just a little bit procedurally on how you're going to enter it into Ariba. Um, we feel that this is just a little less confusing um, and a little more clear on, on kind of what you're supposed to do. And so 
what our guidance is going to be now is instead of, you know, giving the travel, the per diem, and then, you know, covering the different, the rest of it on the meals pay for others line item, we think it's a little bit clearer to just go ahead and put all of it on the meals pay for others line item. And so the um, previous spreadsheet was, you know, guiding it to do one way. And so for this new one, we're going to say, we're going to tell you, you're going to determine, you know, what the reimbursable amount is from the spreadsheet. And then you're just going to put the total on the meals paid for others line item. Um, and then the difference is you're going to zero out that meal. You're going to treat it like a provided meal and you're going to zero it out on that, that traveler's per diem. Uh, we just think it's a little bit easier. That way you're not, you know, you're not figuring out, okay, you know, I'd already put this amount out on the per diem. I need to make sure that that's also not included on the meals paid for others line item. And so there's just, it's a little more confusing when you're, you're having to compare those two things and make sure your totals all add up and everything like that. And so we, we wanted the, the spreadsheet to kind of guide with that sort of new um, guidance. Um, I'm not going to go through every single step. Um, when you do the survey, you're going to have access to all these steps and you can kind of follow them along, kind of pretend like you're using the spreadsheet and then provide some feedback. Um, just for time's sakes for, for the meeting, I want to um, keep things moving along. So just know that in the survey, we'll have all these steps on here and then you can kind of follow it along and see if this is something that you um, would think would be more helpful as a resource for, for help for completing these meal paper others. And so um, just another view. So also I wanted to highlight that there will be within that same spreadsheet, there's going to be guidance for doing it when it's just a single receipt for a single meal. And then we also have the one of the other tabs, which is going to guide you through the process when it's like a grocery receipt and that receipt covers multiple meals. Uh, we knew that that was kind of a gap in the, the previous spreadsheet. Um, what I'm talking about is like when when it's meals pay for others, but the, the person who paid for the meal, what they did is they just went grocery shopping like to Trader Joe's or something like that. You know, they bought a bunch of stuff. They were at like a retreat and then they had a bunch of groceries. And so then it gets a little it gets pretty confusing trying to figure out how to, you know, apply the meals paid for others, you know, spreadsheet to that. In the previous spreadsheet, it only handles, you know, single meals. And so, yeah, trying to manipulate it and get it to work for that scenario uh, was definitely a gap. So we're building, um, and we tried to combine into like one spreadsheet, but it, it was, um, I just could not figure out a way to have both of those be on the, the same thing. So we have separate guidance for when it's a grocery and then separate for when it's, a, it's an individual. And then another tab, well, it's going to kind of guide you and it's just going to um, guide you through the process of how do you, you know, document the meal participants. So as you know, you should be keeping a, you know, a log of who like participated in that, in that meal. And so that'll be kind of the, the third tab, but those will be the same for like the single receipt and then the grocery receipt, you'll then just go to the, um, where you log the, the participants per meal. Uh, but again, that'll, that, this will all be in the survey. Uh, make sure you review it. Um, and the best way to kind of yeah, approach the survey is, to yeah, look at those steps in the within it, and then does it make sense to you? Um, does, um, are you following along and that kind of thing? This is strictly related to travel and not local meetings and events. Um, correct. That's a good question. So, uh, from the meals pay for others um, compliance, we we you have to make the distinguish. Or you have to distinguish whether something is meal pays for others or whether it's hosting and entertaining. So this spreadsheet will just be when once you've determined it to be meals pay for others, then you're going to follow this procedure. Um, hosting and entertaining is is managed on the procurement end, and it, it goes through a module that we that we are not uh, managing. So it's, it's the e reimbursement module. So make sure you're following those those procedures when you're doing hosting and entertaining. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to April Berger. She's going to give you an update on our um, TMCs, which uh, we've been discussing previously. So as I'm sure you've received in our listserv announcement, uh, we decided to award, um, thank you. <laughs> we decided to award contracts to corporate travel management Key Travel and Tangerine Travel. Um, we recently updated our website to make that announcement. And additionally, we added landing pages for our new agencies on our book and pay uh, travel page. Um, we've provided the link for you in the slide. Um, we will be continuing to work with the onboarding process with them. Um, but these landing pages are a way for you to 
uh, create initial contact with these travel agencies um, so you can get more information from them, uh, learn what uh, services they provide, um, and just a, a great point of contact. So um, if you see on their landing page um, that they're asking you to register, it's not so much a, a formal registration, it's more of um, just uh, providing information so that they can contact you. Christofferson is still a contracted uh, travel management company. Uh, we just felt that um, adding more travel agencies to the travel agency pool would help um, with all of the departments on campus. We understand that each department has very specific needs and you know, not one travel agency fits all. So we just thought it would be best to provide a variety for campus. Uh, so that was kind of the initial thought behind doing this. Um, but yes, we are still uh, contracted with Christofferson. Excellent question. Um, on to the next slide. Um, we haven't really received any questions regarding this, but we no longer have a contract with Southwest. Um, the state of Washington uh, decided not to renew it and that contract expired um, the middle of last year. Um, but I think that just speaks to um, the demand um, for Southwest within the state of Washington. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware. All right, thank you, April. So yeah, um, like she was mentioning with the Southwest, it's just uh, good to you for you to know in case somebody comes across it and they're like, oh, what happened to the Southwest? We haven't gotten any inquiries about it. And I know we don't use the Southwest a whole lot just based on where we're traveling to. But if you go to the website, the and if anyone's wondering, the Alaska contract was renewed. Um, all the information is on there. So the state contract for Alaska is still good to go. Uh, but the Southwest one was, was not renewed. Alrighty, on to package deals. So um, what's going on with package deals? So the um, policy and the procedure is, is still the same for package deals, but there's been some clarification added regarding uh, federal funds. Um, and so this was actually um, per instruction from the UW Post-Award Fiscal Compliance. Um, if you don't know that office, they manage um, compliance related to, to grant funding. And so th with that um, under their umbrella is, would be federal uh, grant funding. And they requested that we add some, some clarification. So uh, what's going on with federal funds is because the federal funding is a lot more strict, um, what the, the award office is saying is that the package deal workaround that we have through the package deal policy um, is not allowed on federal funds. And the reason for that is they need to establish, you know, prove certain compliance. Um, for example, the, the Fly America Act, and you know, that is the cheapest coach fare. It's just, it's a lot more stingy and a lot more strict on them proving, you know, the itemization and that, those type of things. Um, so they just wanted to make it clear that that workaround um, of taxing the employee through payroll when the itemization is not available is not a, a valid workaround when you're doing it on federal funds. So if you if you support any federal federal funds, just just keep that in mind. Um, if it's the um, federal funds, so the best thing to do would be to just educate your travelers and have them avoid package deals then for sure. Um, sometimes they will release the itemization, so it may be okay, but you would not want to risk it um, because you don't want to run into the situation where, and it does happen, especially yeah, through Expedia and things like that. They just, they won't release the proper itemization. And then if it's on federal funds, then then you won't even be able to follow the workaround of the employee being taxed, um, just removing, you know, 30% from the, the reimbursement. So then they may just be out of out of luck entirely on their, their reimbursement. So for package deals, um, federal funds, definitely a big, big no-no. Um, in general, we also, and also just want to make it clear, in general, we kind of recommend avoiding them also um, for that same reason. So um, it's worse on federal funds because you may not get a reimbursement at all. But for, um, you know, our travelers on other types of funding, they're going to run the risk of losing 30% of their reimbursement when Expedia doesn't give them the, the itemization. Um, and who wants to lose, you know, what they were supposed to get on their, their reimbursement. Okay. 
exchange of funds between travelers. Um, this is a topic that comes up pretty frequently. Um, I can't remember if we've talked about it before. If we have, it's been definitely a long time. So what we're talking about here, so the, the most common example is for lodging expense, where people are sharing rooms for lodging. Uh, what will happen is, you know, those travelers need to figure out, you know, who's covering the costs and who's paying who and those kind of things. So this is kind of a more of an educational thing as opposed to, you know, a policy change or anything like that. So what happens is, um, you know, two people will be staying in the same hotel room and then one of the travelers pays that other traveler um, in the form of cash or by using an app like Venmo. If you've used Venmo before, it's just it's an app you can download on your phone. You can transfer money from one person to another. And so the big thing with this is the reimbursement must always go to the traveler who actually paid for the lodging expense. So in that example, kind of what I was pointing to is if it's two people staying in the hotel room and one person pays for the hotel and then that other person, then they exchange, you know, funds between each other. When it gets to Ariba and we do our expense report, we can only reimburse the person who had actually paid that expense. And so what I see in departments do is they try to just, instead of that, they'll do two expense reports. So they'll try to reimburse both people. And on one of them, they're just trying to reimburse that other person just for them, the fact that they exchanged funds. What we're saying is that is not allowed because it breaks the audit trail. So that exchange of funds between those travelers does not, it breaks the auditability to that transaction. And that makes it not IRS, IRS compliant. It doesn't meet the IRS accountable plan. What if one of the travelers is from another university? Um, there's, no, it's, there's no exception based on the type of traveler. This is for all traveler types. So even if they're from another institution, non-UW, if it's employees, the same thing applies. It's just it's not IRS um, accountable plan compliant. Can we use the traveler's bank or credit card statements as proof of payment? Um, so you... Yeah, that's more kind of related to like just actually turning in a receipt. So um, for for lodging, if, if we're reimbursing after the fact, they need to provide that itemization um, for the lodging. Um, I would consider that to be kind of separate to, to what we're talking about right now. Um, and there's, but uh, what I will say is there's no like type of receipt or anything like that will, that will justify or allow paying but the exchange of those funds between those two people. It doesn't matter if it's Venmo or if it's cash, we need to pay whoever actually paid for the expense. What if the traveler receiving the money writes the second traveler receipt that is attached to the ER? What if the traveler receiving the money writes the second traveler receipt that is attached to the ER? Um, we wouldn't allow them to just write a receipt for it. Um, it needs to be, you know, the official receipt from the, the lodging. I would say that um, that wouldn't meet the IRS accountable plan because it's still not auditing to the actual transaction. It's just somebody writing a receipt on their own. Um, less than $75 supplies. Uh, what we're talking about here is in just relation to our receipt policy. Well, I got another question coming. How would the budget be replenished for the amount the second traveler non-UW employee pay back to the first traveler? Um, there wouldn't really need to be a, a scenario of replenishing because the funding was still gonna pay that amount. Um, if so it just depends on, you know, was, was the budget allowed to pay for both of those travelers? If it was, the reimbursement just goes to the one traveler. There's no scenario where we're like actually replenishing anything to the budget. If, so let's say like the, but the funding couldn't pay for that second traveler, you just wouldn't pay it then. Um, it wouldn't make any difference to like what's coming in and out of the budget, if that makes sense. Um, less than $75 supplies. So um, back to that. So we're talking about our receipt policy. So supply, what we're talking about are supplies, you know, required for business, purchase on travel status, not considered to be an incidental expense, which would be covered by the, the per diem allowance. Um, we just wanted to clarify that this is no longer protected under the $75 receipt rule. Um, therefore, we're crying a receipt. So if you, if you remember from our, if you were here for our last meeting, we discussed some uh, receipt changes. And what we did was we um, further defined, you know, what is protected under that $75. 
And so it, it became a little bit more strict. It was a little bit more open before where it was um, kind of kind of open to anything travel related. If it was under 75, unless it was like a certain expense, then, then you can't do it. But now it's kind of further defined to say these are exactly the expenses that are protected under $75. We just want to clarify that supplies is not one of them. Um, and an example would be, you know, you're on your business trip and you need to get, you know, sticky notes or pens or something like that, or people will buy, you know, like a poster or something, um, stuff like that. Um, those are just, those are supplies. It's not protected under the, the, those miscellaneous items. So they need to turn in a receipt for those. Um, but a couple of examples of like what is protected, you know, ground transport or uh, car service expenses like Uber and Lyft, um, public transportation, um, things like that. And it's all on our receipt page if you, if you want to take a look. It, it defines exactly what is protected. Okay. All right, ground transportation to meals. So this has been a um, kind of an ongoing topic that has been coming to me pretty frequently. Um, and we, we just wanted, so this is another educational opportunity. We get lots of questions related to, you know, taking Ubers and Lyfts to go get meals when people are on conferences and meetings and things like that. And so we just uh, wanted to help educate you on making, you know, the proper decision on whether it's allowed or not. Um, sometimes, you know, these can get a little bit subjective. Um, so what we like to just, our, the best thing we can do is just, you know, help guide you to, to make the, the right decision. Um, and so the first main thing is how we've kind of approached it before is that we said, you know, that it needs to be required for business for that ground transportation meal to be okay. We've kind of flipped our guidance a little bit. We thought this maybe will help, you know, help assist you with making the, the right determination. And still, it's still the same policy. We're just kind of wording it or we're approaching the guidance on it a little bit differently. So what we kind of say now is it must be identified to not be personal preference or convenience. So that's kind of the main thing you're really protecting against on trying to figure out whether that ground transportation is allowed. So a few examples of what would not be allowable as far as, you know, taking an Uber to go get a meal is if it was a result of these, you know, personal decisions. So one of them is personal dietary restrictions. So if you, um, if you have anybody saying, oh, you know, none of, the, none of the food at the hotel was vegan. So I took an Uber um, to go, you know, a couple miles away to get, to get a vegan option. That would be a personal dietary restriction. So that would, that would not be allowed. They're, you know, they're welcome to do it, totally fine. They just need to know that it's, um, that it's something that they're gonna cover on their own. So we totally get it, you know, um, it's important that, that they, they follow that, that restriction that they're on, um, but they just need to know that it's a personal expense. Um, vegetarian, very similar, um, gets grouped in there and uh, religious reasons as well. Um, if you go to like our meal page, we actually define all this stuff as something that's considered, you know, um, not an exception to like a provided meal and stuff like that. It's just, it's a personal dietary restriction. Another one is to desire for a tastier option. So, well, um, this one, yeah, it gets a little, gets a little subjective to, um, but in general, like in general, this is, you know, really never going to be um, an exception to, to the meals that are provided. So if someone, you know, just didn't like the conference food, they just didn't think it tastes good. And they said, oh, you know, I took an, an Uber to go get something that they enjoyed more. And that in that case, it's just going to be on them. They're welcome to do it. Um, it would just be a personal expense. Um, how would we even know their reason for taking the Uber? Um, so yeah, to be honest, I, I, I realize some of this stuff is going to be, you know, very difficult or um, hard to track. It's more just kind of educational for when it, get, it comes up and people are asking questions or, you know, or if you're writing department policy on it. Um, these are kind of the things you should be thinking about when you're approaching it, if it's a problem. Um, some departments, it's just not really a problem. You know, people are just, they're eating the conference food. It's no big deal. It just doesn't seem to be a problem. I'm just more approaching it for um, departments are running to this issue and they're noticing some abuse. And so that way you have some backstory on kind of how to approach it and what you should be thinking about. Uh, wow, has that reasoning come through your office? Taste your option. I have, I've, I've seen it. I've just not really taste your option, but people will say like, they just didn't like the conference food. Oh, can I, you know, can I get my per diem? Um, and usually, yeah, our answer would be no in that case. And the same thing would apply to, you know, getting a ground transportation to, to meal. So it does actually come up. Are pests on the buffet still, cover, still covered as disaster? Um, can you clarify on that question? I don't, 
I don't understand exactly what that means. Um, to clarify, if a meal is provided by the hotel or conference, the only allowable exception for meals per diem is medical. Um, yeah, generally, yeah, the only exception would be medical. So uh, my third bullet point, I said, so for, for any meal accommodations related to, to like a medical accommodation for travel, we would um, rec refer to our uh, guidance on ADA. So the best thing would be if, if someone actually has, you know, a strong food allergy or whatever the medical condition is that prevents them from eating that, you know, that conference food, they need to get that on file with the, the UW DSO office, so the, the proper HR unit. That way, you know, if it's ever audited, um, the department's not uh, reviewing any medical information. So the department should not be reviewing medical information. Get that on file with the DSO, and then then they can act, start claiming that per diem, and then they're they're protected as far as the the compliance. Uh, is there an, any exception for if it's a medical allergy? Now options are provided. No options. So yeah, um, back to that that DSO office. So you'll want to make sure that traveler gets it gets it on file. Um, pests. I received photos of mouse droppings, and someone brought me a bug in a bag. My attendee left a took a cab. They are going to the same location in a couple weeks. Oh my gosh. Um, that's yeah. That would be just kind of a crazy one off type situation. Um, we would probably just you know if you can get. Uh, if you can, you know, prove it and really back it up, I'm sure that would probably hold up in an audit with something kind of gnarly like that. Um, hopefully that's not happening to too many people. Um, but in that case, I would say, yeah, if you just document it well, that's just an extraordinary circumstance um, to show that it was just completely unreasonable for business for them to have eaten that meal or unsafe to the traveler or something like that. Um, but that one would be, yeah, something rarely that would, you know, come up or would be okay. I just found out I have staff who selects hotel rates without breakfast and then claims breakfast, but she doesn't eat breakfast, only coffee. I'm assuming there's nothing I can do about this, but it irks me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you could try to approach the traveler and, you know, make them try to change their decision making and tell them that, you know, that doesn't fit in our policy accountability plan of being most economical and reasonable business planning, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of a tough one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so kind of putting um, April just gave me a good point. So um, referring to the second bullet point for, for Wendy's question, you know, if, if you when you're running into these problems, you can just remember, you can always write department policy. I know there are there have been some departments that have like consulted with me and actually come up with policy to address these issues. So if you're if you have like specific problems where people are abusing it, write a policy. Um, and, and then that way you can actually point to something that they're supposed to be following if they are breaking, you know, whatever that weird thing that they're doing is. Um, for ground travel, you can look up addresses. And if you're really not sure, you can ask the traveler where they took the Uber Lyft beyond that. It's hard to tell. Yeah. So kind of back to what I was saying before. I know it, it is difficult to manage, um, but departments are just kind of tasked with doing, you know, their due diligence, doing the best they can, coming up with policy if things are being like clearly abused and, and all that. All right, let's keep moving. All right, this is a fun one. Not allowed use of e-travel. So this comes up pretty rarely, um, but we wanted to address it just in case maybe there are folks out there that think this is okay. Um, it's come up a couple times. We have seen people do it. And so um, when it does, we've told people right away to, to stop doing it. Um, but in case you have seen people do it and you weren't sure if it was okay or not, um, we just want to make sure we squash it and you know that this for sure is not okay. So what you cannot do with e-travel is you are not allowed to set the traveler type to non-UW and have the check printed in an institution or a company's name. Um, the module is designed to reimburse individuals only. So people are doing this as like a workaround to the invoicing modules instead of, you know, registering a supplier and things like that. Um, it's like a loophole sort of shortcut, um, but it is definitely not compliant. Our module is specifically designed as far as the compliance and everything to only reimburse an individual. It has nothing built in regarding, you know, reimbursing an institution, but people are getting creative. They're selecting it non-UW. Non-UW is a free text box. And then, they, you know, they're putting the University of Oregon and they're mailing the check to the University of Oregon and then having them cash it. Um, just know that that is definitely uh, not allowed. And so uh, just make sure you're following the um, proper channel, like invoicing channels 
there are some um, kind of rare instances where like we have to pay, you know, an institution directly for travel. Generally, we're doing, you know, in the form of reimbursement, um, but it does come up from time to time. So if that does come up, just know that, you know, you can go through the invoicing channels if there's like a business need for it and make sure that you do do that and don't use e-travel as like a, a workaround to, to get them the, the money. Would you clarify lodging acceptance exceptions for safety reasons? Um, so um, just so you guys know, so this is a, a little off topic. It's um, just related to exceptions to um, lodging per diem. Um, one of the one of the exceptions to lodging per diem, mean, meaning you can reimburse over to the per diem, is is for safety. Um, and to be honest, yeah, we just have kind of general guidance. It's just if, if something, if any sort of crazy sort of safety or critical function happens in which you need to lodge somebody within 50 miles, what you can do is get that approved by an the authorized person, which is generally going to be like the the chair of the, or the director of the department. Um, or if it's grant funding, it would usually be a PI or whoever the or the chair that the the grant was awarded to. You can get safety is one of the reasons you can claim. Um, wait a second. Oh, I realize I'm I'm addressing the wrong thing. Um, so that I was talking about that's exceptions to travel status. Uh, for if it's over the per diem, um, and it's a lodging exception, um, that would be. So what can kind of happen is if, if something like kind of crazy or something like that is going on in the area, or let's say, I would say this is very, very rare, um, but I have seen a couple of situations where like uh, people have documented saying, you know, the two off, like two, the one, you know, hotel option that was under the per diem is just completely unsafe. Maybe there's um, like news articles about bad things happening at that hotel or something like that then you could document that to show, okay, the options that were under per diem, the department is considered to be unsafe. And so now we're reimbursing over per diem because we're putting them in, a, in the safest option, something like that. Um, and something like that, I would, I would recommend, you know, attaching like an administrator approval just as a, as a backup for it, um, if, that, if that does come up. Or in the case of a natural disaster, same kind of thing. So something crazy is going on in the area um, that you can you can get something like that approved as being over per diem because uh, if a lot of people are like needing to be you know lodged in the same area, it can spike their rates. So in that case, then then it could be uh, reimbursed. Let me keep moving. All right, so banquet meals clarification. Um, there is actually no policy change on this. Um, this is just addressing we accidentally had some misinformation um, on our website for a little bit. And so um, this is, you know, uh, we're just kind of taking responsibility. We realized we had just wrong information on there for a little bit. Um, it wasn't for a long time, but it was for, I want to guess, like a month or two. So it's the same policy. We're just, um, I'm just reiterating it and clarifying on it and kind of addressing the fact that we, there was some misinformation floated around on this. Um, and so the, what the banquet meal um, policy is, is this is um, in regards to conference travel, the, a lot of times there'll be like a banquet dinner type event that's going on. Um, as long as it's, you know, conference and seminar sponsored, that it has speakers or pertinent round table um, discussions, then it can be, it can be reimbursed. Um, and it can be reimbursed separate from per diem at actual costs. Um, but keep in mind, so the first thing is you're determining it to be a banquet meal. Okay, it's eligible. Now you're going to reimburse it on the, the banquet meal line item in Ariba. And then, but if you do do that, make sure that you zero out their per diem allowance for that meal. It is considered a provided meal. Um, if you reimburse both and or if you gave them per diem and gave them that banquet meal for dinner, it would be, it would be double dipping. Um, and we realized there was some misinformation on the website that said like that they could claim the per diem also. Um, and so if you wrote that in your notes or had that in your, your, or in your policy anywhere, just make sure that you remove that. Um, it is considered a provided meal. And so um, do make sure that, that that gets clarified. Okay. All right. And now I'm going to pass it back to April. She's going to talk to you about the travel ban to China, which you may have seen already. As I'm sure most of you have heard on the news, and additionally, um, the email from the provost, there uh, officially is a current travel ban to China. Um, we have updated our homepage to include this notice. Um, and in the provost email, 
Um, they did say it was until further notice. Um, and the only exception is with a personal travel, but even then um, that is uh, not recommended. Um, there is a waiver process set up through the Office of Global Affairs on a case-by-case -case basis. You can visit their website on the link provided in the slide. We also have um, a link on our quick link section of our homepage um, that takes you to Global Affairs homepage um, if you need more additional information on that. Now we're going to discuss the Real ID Act. So um, there's no changes when it, when it comes to the, the Real ID Act. Um, we just realized we haven't talked about it um, since January last year. So we were, we we're due for a reminder. Um, and so um, if you're not aware of the Real ID Act, um, this is, <clears throat> oh, we got a question about China. So what about layovers in China? Um, you'll, I, I, I have no idea. Um, you'll want to reach out to the, the Office of Global Affairs on that, maybe get some clarification. Um, but I'd imagine it applies to, to layovers and anything like that. Um, but you may want to, yeah, reach out to, I would reach out to the provost office if you have any specific examples that, that you're wondering about. Uh, we aren't experts on exactly, you know, what they're, um, every detail of what they're talking about. Um, they're the ones who, who issued the ban. So if you have any kind of weird one-offs like that and you're trying to figure out if it's okay, I would guess that it's not. Um, but if you want to double check, I would check with them. So the Real ID Act, oh, sorry. Um, this was federal law. Uh, so this is a federal law that passed, you know, quite a few years back, but Washington State is just getting caught up. Um, but we will be officially caught up with the federal law change on October 1st, 2020. So uh, we need to, we actually have to follow the guideline or the, um, the policy from the Real ID Act starting October 1st, 2020. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this already. Um, how this is going to affect our travelers. So there will, um, there's going to be changes about the ID standards that, that have to be met when people are going through airport security. Uh, we provided a link with some some more information. This is kind of the link that we've been kind of following. We um, just a nice kind of clean. Some, it has a nice clean website with with clear guidance and everything like that. So if you want to get like the full details on everything, um, that's a great great link to follow. Um, but in general, just know that on October first, there's going to be um, significant changes to what's allowed to get through security. Will something be posted on the travel um, office website regarding Real ID Act? Um, we can definitely get this posted to the the homepage now that we're kind of getting the home stretch. Um, we can put that. We'll put that on the the homepage. We'll put. We'll put I'll put the link to um, to that website with all the the guidance and everything like that. So I think that's I think that's a great idea. Uh, we should have that in our our notices. Is this for international travel only, or both national and or, um, domestic international? So yeah, this is this is pertaining to to all travel. It's just it's just getting through um, Washington. Um, through the TSA, you know, at SeaTac and just any airport in Washington, it's gonna, they're gonna be enforcing this. It doesn't matter, you know, where, if you're going to Oregon or if you're going to, to anywhere, it's just, they're gonna, they're, they'll be enforcing this no matter what. And so the big thing is that a standard Washington driver's license or identif identification card does not meet the Real ID Act, so it will not be accepted. I myself need to figure this out. I only have a Washington driver's license, so I need to get my, my passport and all that. So um, if you just have a standard driver's license or an ID card, um, it, it, you're gonna get blocked. So, you know, people that are traveling, you know, all year long, um, they can get through with that license and it's no longer going to work. So um, there are um, existing identification options that will work. They have um, even a larger list on that website. So if you're kind of wondering, oh, I have this type of ID, does, it, does that meet it? I didn't give it a complete list. These are just some, some popular ones. So pop back to that website and they'll give you some more examples of what will meet or how you can get through security. Uh, but some big ones. So if you have a passport or enhanced license, um, which are ones that a lot of people have, um, you're good to go. So if the Washington, Washington State Enhanced License will get you through. Um, U.S. military military ID and green card, a couple of big ones that, that people have as well. Um, those are strong enough identifications. They meet the Real ID Act. Um, so just so you know. Okay. And I'm going to pass it back to April. She's going to talk about rental bikes and scooters. So this is a new addition to our ground transportation uh, page, we found that we were getting a lot of questions and a lot of expense reports um, with 
rental bike and rental scooter expenses. Uh, this is an, uh, an allowable expense. Um, it's just another form of ground transportation. Um, you've seen them, I'm sure, around campus, the Uber jump bikes, the line bikes. These are also available in other cities and states. Um, and it is reimbursed at the actual cost and it does require a receipt. Um, however, this is not applicable to um, personally owned um, bicycles or scooters like we would a personal owned vehicle. Um, people trying to claim mileage for that, um, that's not allowed for a personally owned bicycle. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's really a great uh, alternative to an actual vehicle, um, but we wanted to make sure that we added this to our policy since it's becoming more popular. And yeah, we just thought it'd be good for, you know, campus to be aware that that it is eligible. Um, they're becoming more popular and it, it can be just a, an easier way to get to a meeting if there's just a scooter and you're only going a couple blocks or a few blocks, you just pop on one of those. So just so you know that, that it is eligible. And we have uh, surprisingly had people try to get bicycle mileage and all that. So just know that that's not allowed. Done. All right, so now we are ready to transition. So I'm going to pass it off to Rachel from UW Finance Transformation. And she's gonna give you uh, some updates on the, the program, how it's relating to travel and all that. Yeah, hi, good morning all. Um, I'm Rachel Drapel, I'm on the Finance Transformation team as a change manager. And before that, I was part of the procurement organization here, so I'm always excited to be back. Um, yeah, can you all hear me? Okay, um, so last time um, that we spoke was the first time we attended the Travel Forum and we spent a little bit of time talking about kind of our big goals and vision, some current state challenges um, in our high level timeline. So I'd like to recap some of that information really quickly. Um, we have some updates to these slides and they're a little bit more detailed, so I think it would be helpful to go through. So what is finance transformation? Finance transformation, um, we've got kind of our bullet points on the big slide, but essentially we are doing three big things in finance transformation for the University of Washington. The first one is that we're gonna replace our legacy system, FAS, with Workday. Um, and that really speaks to some of the current state challenges that we have talked about of how hard it is to find data, the right data, um, an aging system that's written in a coding language no one knows anymore, things like that. Um, the second thing that we're going to do is as we are in the process of implementing our new system and moving into Workday, we're going to be thinking about all of the processes and all the financial work that we currently do at UW, right? So as we have this opportunity to go from this really old outdated structure to something that's new, a system that's from the 21st century and is on the cloud, um, we're going to be thinking you know, what doesn't make sense for us to do and where are controls needed or not needed and how can we be more efficient and think through our work? Um, so that's gonna be the second big piece. And then as we kind of redesign and think through all the work that we need to do to be compliant and to get our reporting done um, here at the university, we're also going to kind of think about, do we need to be sharing work across units or wh where does it make sense to get this new body of work done? Or how is this new body of work it's really an old body of work, right? Because we're still gonna be doing the same things. We're gonna have the same reporting and the same compliance requirements, uh, but we wanna think how, how will this translate once we move over to Workday? Um, so that's what we're gonna be doing in a nutshell. And let's see if I can switch to the next slide. Perfect. Um, so we had kind of an old, um, high level timeline slide. We've got an updated graphic. It's also updated on our websites. So way back in 2018 when we started, we did readiness. Um, some of you may remember the giant benchmarking and data gathering effort that we did then. Uh, so we got a lot of that data in 2018 about where are we currently at UW. We had a lot of work um, thinking through and taking in what everybody around UW is doing on this financial space. And then, so the second half of last year, July to December, uh, we call it the design phase, but it's a little bit of a misnomer. We actually were really focused on our scope, schedule, and budget for the program, which we determined based on all of the de benchmarking data that we got before. Um, so design really was more about saying what's in scope, what's out of scope, 
what systems might get changed, what systems might not get changed. Also, what are all of the systems that we have to think about? Um, and I'm glad to say, if you all have not heard already, we had our scope, our schedule, and our budget approved by the Board of Regents um, and the state at the very end of last year. So that brings us to where we are today. Uh, we're in the implementation phase. So we have the next 30 months to start looking at all of the data, all of the processes that we're thinking through, all of the changes that might happen. We're gonna be anticipating them, communicating about them. We're gonna be reaching out to lots of stakeholders, both leadership and fiscal staff, um, to really get our arms around exactly what is changing, what is going on here, and how is the best way that um, we'll move forward to make sure that we're considering everything that we need to. Um, so here is actually where we're gonna have boots on the ground, so to speak. Uh, we're going to be building out processes, configuring our system, doing testing, things like that. And once we have that go live date, which the state approved as July 2022, um, we'll be in a stabilization phase. So we are not going to disappear right after go live. Um, we also have consultant support and workday support um, through stabilization to make sure um, that everything is working as intended. So, whoops, to get a little bit more in the detail about that 30 months phase, we already talked about this a little bit. Right now we're in what's called the plan phase. So we're um, really ironing out all of the activities and uh, coordinating all the events and things that we have to do between now and go live as a program, including all the people that we need to reach out to, the, all the people that we need to talk to um, and things like that. So some of you may be aware, um, we have process transformation teams, which I believe we spoke about a little bit last forum. Um, we have gotten the members for those and we're in the process of standing them up and working through them. Our process transformation teams are going to really help us through architect and configure and prototype um, they'll probably also help us in test too, um, to really take a look at each of these bodies of work that we are going to be transitioning into Workday and out of BAS. Um, and so they're really going to be some of these people that help us, right? We also talked a little bit about change champions, um, which you all may be interested in helping out or being kind of our eyes and ears on the program, um, as we had also mentioned. Um, and then the other big part that's kind of a a part where we'll have engagement um, with potentially people here or your leadership or a mix of both is also user task groups. So as our process transformation teams help us get that subject matter expertise and think through decisions and think through impacts um, of how we move our current state to our future state for financial work, they also will have experts in even um, narrow fields of of interest or of discussion. And those will be people in our user task groups. So they'll be kind of spun up as they're needed. Um, they won't last the whole problem. It's really just maybe we'll have a user task group for travel potentially um, to make sure that as we consider how travel might be impacted by fi finance transformation, that we have the right people in the room and the right knowledge in the room to really help inform and guide those decisions. Um, so we're gonna be doing a lot of that kind of thought work and a lot of that thinking through and reaching out and gaining expertise in plan and an architect. Um, once we've got that body of work figured out and it's a little bit um, more concrete, we're going to configure and prototype. So for the next nine months of implementation, we are going to be taking all the ideas and all the expertise that we have and actually get it into a working model, into Workday. Um, we'll be still working a lot with our um, expert, our subject matter experts here um, and kind of setting everything up and then we will be testing for a full nine months. This is where people are going to get to see the system. This is where uh, a lot of training is going to start um, around the test and deploy phase um, to make sure that the people who are helping us make decisions actually do demos, right? And they actually see things work. So this is going to be um, a lot, a lot of things kind of packed, I know, into one slide of all the work that we're going to be doing, but we'll be regularly communicating and engaging. Um, and kind of the second half of the slides we have are more about how can you learn more and where can you see all the things that we have going on to make sure that you guys um, have those resources as well. Um, so we've talked a little bit about what are the things that are going to get redesigned or where are these bodies of financial work that we're currently doing at UW that we're going to think through and just make sure, you know, maybe some of the processes or some of the things that we have to do right now 
don't serve us as well as they could. Um, so here's a list of each, we're calling them the end-to-ends or the wing-to-wings. Here's our nine end-to-end -end business processes that we're focusing on during finance transformation. Um, you guys may be wondering, right, where does travel fit into this? Uh, travel is gonna fit into the procurement and supply chain part of finance transformation. Um, and we do have more information about kind of some high level goals and the work that we're gonna be doing um, throughout these processes that we actually had vetted through the state and the Board of Regents. And um, we've got more of those on our website. Do you guys normally do questions at end or? Um, I can address this one. Sure. Um, so is Ariba going away or my FT? Um, so, you know, big decisions are still being made, but it's it's looking like, yeah, Ariba most likely will be going away. Um, and then my FD um, will definitely, yeah, will be replaced by will be replaced by Workday Financials. So most likely those two things will be will be going away. Mm -hmm. Um so where can you guys hear more, right? Um, something that you likely heard last year um, and maybe even moving up is that we've been really focused on what's in scope, what's out of scope, where are we going? And I'm happy to say that we are in a position where we can start communicating a lot more and that we have, there are still things we don't know, right? As Kelly had mentioned, we're still going through some systems, including the big decisions, things like Ariba. Um, MyFD we know is going to change because MyFD right now is built specifically for FAS and we know we're getting rid of FAS. Um, I see there's another one, will Stage be going away? This is one of those that we actually don't know yet. Um, I believe where we're at today is that we're um, thinking through what an iteration might look like between Sage and our new system, uh, but that decision has not been made yet, right? So while there are still some things that are uncertain, we do have um, more concrete direction and more concrete um, messaging that we can get out to you guys. For instance, what are the big transformation goals for these processes we know we're going to do? So the first place that you can look um, for information is our public facing website. I've got the link for the website in the little slide notes that you guys will get at the after this presentation. Um, and so here we've got really high level kind of information that anybody um, might be curious to know in the program. So we have an about UWFT section that talks about why are we doing this transformation? Why are we going with Workday? Uh, what's the timeline? What's gonna be going on here? Um, our stay informed section is gonna be about the newsletters that we send out. Um, we're also thinking about starting a blog. And then we have um, under the collaborate session, more information on things like our process transformation teams, user task groups. Um, we have our governance and our sponsors around UW. So these are the big subject matter experts that are helping guide us as we move through transformation to make sure that we're making the right decisions and that we're engaging the right people at the right time. Um, so this is kind of the first stop that I would recommend to anyone that's interested in learning generally more about the program. We also have an internal website. So anyone with the UW Net ID is welcome to hop on here and to look at this website. Um, you can see in the top left right now, it's called the UWFT Change Network. Uh, we're actually going to be renaming it and we're in the process of getting that done. Um, with the rename, we're also going to be totally revamping the site. So what you see today is what the site looks like today, um, but the site is likely gonna look different in a few months once we get the relaunch of this website done. And this website is gonna have a lot more detailed information. It's gonna have information that really isn't necessarily something that the public is interested in or would want to see, but is appropriate for our UW employees to see. So it's gonna have um, information on things like our events that are coming up. It's gonna have um, detailed information about each of the nine end to ends. There'll be FAQs uh, for some of these specific things, right? Like what do we know um, about Sage today? Do we know, do we have any updates? That's something that the public necessarily won't mean anything to them, but it's important to think about within our UW ecosystem. So we'll have kind of those UW specific change information um, and other resources that are just a little bit more detailed and a little bit more focused on change activities and things that we're gonna be going on in the internal website. So in the slide notes, I have the current link to the internal UW employee website. And once we get the new website launched, we will definitely be communicating um, with everyone to make sure that they have access to this new launch of the site. Um, this will all be also be linked on our external, our public facing page here. Um, so there'll be an announcement there. And then as well, um, if you guys have any questions that we don't get through through 
like a Q and A, or if you have any questions after you peruse through our websites, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we have a dedicated email, uwftask at uw.edu, um, where you can send your questions or feedback. We would love to hear from you. And also we would love to meet with you guys in your units. So if you're interested in having us come out and take a deep dive into maybe some of the changes that are gonna happen or spend time um, talking about what we're gonna do in the program and where we're at or answering questions, please use that email address to reach out to us um, and work with your leadership. Get them to invite us to um, like an all hands or any of the team meetings and we'll be happy to show up. Uh, I will say also, if you're not on our newsletter, you can email UWFT ask to ask to get on the newsletter and we'll get you on there. Um, and then you won't miss any of these big updates like the relaunch of our internal website or any other big program updates that we've got going on. And then last but not least, but wait, there's more. Um, thinking about the resources and the things that we're really starting to be able to communicate out and um, as we move forward, I just wanted to give you guys a list of some handy links um, for about UWFT, the R Stay Informed, um, which will have instructions and um, past newsletters on it. Also, we're hiring. If any of you are interested in joining the program or thinking through, please take a look at our join us page and see if there are any, um, any job positions that you may know or you may know somebody else that might be a good fit because um, we're at the point where we're really ready and ramping up to get through all the work that we need to do in the implementation phase. Um, and then on our internal website, some of those details that you may not have heard because we're just at the point of being able to talk in more detail about them. We've got a lot of fact sheets um, talking about the program and kind of those three big transformations that I had mentioned that we're doing. We have our transformation goals for each of those end to ends that might be interesting for you all to hear. And then we have a glossary too, because there's lots of um, terms and acronyms that we have around UW and in UW fashion, we are also making some new ones within the UWFT program. Um, so that's all I have for you guys today, but yeah. All righty. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and so now we're going to transition over to CIBT. And so if you uh, support international travel, they are um, one of our, our, ven our vendors for providing a visa. So if you support international travel, you have, you know, travelers that are struggling with getting visas and that type of thing. Um, you'll definitely want to stick around and hear this. And so I am going to actually... <clears throat> pass it off to Craig Collins, um, and he should be able to share his screen. So go ahead, Craig. And um, can you also text your, text your mic to see if um, everyone can hear you? So um, uh, if someone in the chat me? can just confirm they can hear Craig, um, that would be great. Can everyone hear me? All right, perfect. And then um, go ahead and share your screen um, to the, your slides, Craig. And last question, can everyone see my screen? Okay. Um, we can see it. Is there any way to make it full screen? Yeah, I can. I will not be able to see questions. So if I could Maybe in view. <laughs> let me know, that would be great. How about that? Okay, Is there we okay. go. Perfect. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll meet myself so we don't get any additional feedback. Okay, perfect. Yeah, just, just let me know if, you, uh, if there are any questions, then I'll go from here. So first of all, thank you very much for allowing me uh, to talk today. Just a brief introduction. Um, Mandy McNair is uh, our regional manager. She is regional director, I should say. She is um, oversees our op op operations for the U.S. She is also based in Seattle, and so she knows your account very well. And I'm sure many of you may have, over the course of many years, here been involved and uh, talked with Mandy. Uh, my name is Craig Collins. I am the I head up the account management team for North America, and uh, I also directly manage the uh, overall relationship with the University of Washington. So, again, I really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to talk today, and uh, looking forward to any additional questions that you may have. We just go through here. Please don't hesitate to just ask questions as they come up and uh, we will address them as they go. Um, so wanna talk about the agenda today, competitive advantage, some of the services and value of service we add, 
uh, expectations that you and your travelers should expect, and then just also providing feedback. So, you know, who is CIBT A, A Briggs? Well, first of all, um, I think some of you may may very well be aware of the name of A Briggs. Uh, that is a company that we merged with several years ago. Um, so the site today still has A Briggs. So you would still go on to abriggs.com, and I'll get to that in a few slides here. You'd still go on to abriggs.com, but Throughout the course of the presentation, I'm probably going to switch back and forth between CIBT and ABRIX, knowing that they are all the same company. CIBT is um, another brand that we use uh, besides the ABRIX brand. CIBT is actually the parent company. Um, we are one of the largest visa and passport companies in the world. And uh, so that's where you'll kind of hear me go back and forth between ABRIX and CIBT. So who are we? If you are not familiar with us, we uh, have over 60 wholly owned offices in 25 countries. Uh, we support uh, clients and des to destinations of more than 150. Uh, so we are truly a global operation uh, with coverage in, uh, as I said, 25 countries around the world, but we can also provide visa support in just about every single country of the world with an ex exception of maybe like a North Korea or Syria or Cuba. Um, so we have, we have deeply knowledgeable experts. We have over 1600 visa and immigration uh, professionals that work globally that are able to provide assistance with travel uh, to outbound destinations from the US. And then uh, as I said, in the other 25 countries um, and around the world. Uh, we are the industry leading technology solutions provider. Uh, we have, you have access to over 2 million uh, combinations when it comes to visa inquiries. Uh, we provide interfaces that allow you to uh, provide reports uh, internally to within your organization. Travelers are able to check on the status of their uh, application real time 24 seven. Um, and then they are also able to start some online applications as well. So there is a lot of technology involved with uh, the product offering that we offer today. Um, we have worked with, with you to develop a, a dedicated portal for your travelers so that they can go on, your logo's on there. Um, you'll see some screenshots and a little bit of how customized it is. But again, we are, we have the capability uh, that we can provide any customization, a lot of customization that you may need to work with the different travelers and unique programs that your university offers. Um, and you know, what's really become important throughout the years is that we are fully compliant and secure. Um, we've all hear about hacks and data breaches uh, with very sensitive information. Obviously your travelers are, are handing over passports to us um, with some very confidential information. We are fully compliant when it comes to all of the appropriate uh, safeguards in the industry today so that you know that your, uh, your traveler's uh, data is protected by using CIBT. As I said, here's a little brief illustration of where we are today. We have 23 offices within the Americas, 29 offices within the EMEA region, three in India, two in China, and then 10 within the APAC region. Uh, again, we are, our, our employees speak 20 different languages and we have over 1,700 team members uh, in 19 time zones. As I mentioned before, again, very important about data security here. Uh, we have four geographically dispersed SOC 2 approved data centers. Um, we are a trusted partner to 75% of the Fortune 500 75% of the Fortune 500 companies, sorry about that, uh, compliant in GDPR that, as you, you may be aware, uh, was signed about a year, about two years ago now, almost two years in May, uh, in Europe, in the European Union, but there are things that are applicable here into the U.S., uh, so we are fully compliant in that. Um, and then just on the bottom here, some of our uh, certifications, TRACE you may have heard of, IS, ISO is another certification. So, uh, you know, we have your traveler's data protected. So what does the APRIS program for uh, University of Washington look like for you? Um, we provide a global consistent footprint. Uh, we, you are, your travelers are able to talk to our, our advisors. Um, 
throughout the week uh, where they can seek advice on filling out applications and the best process to move forward with the process. Some countries are more complex than others. Uh, you know, again, that can be through the phone or we can also offer uh, offline, offline, online and offline support. Uh, we have integration with the TMCs, uh, GD, GDSs and the online booking tools. And uh, you know, that is an opportunity to provide a Visa Alert product to travelers. I talked about our, our technology, uh, you know, and a compliance. And then, of course, as I said, uh, you have Mandy located in Seattle, Washington. I am on the East Coast, uh, but uh, overall manage the overall relationship as well. So you've got a couple of different levels of, of account management support. And then, of course, reporting um, is available uh, upon request. So just talk about some of the services and values of the services here. This is the ABRIGS process overview. In a nutshell, uh, the traveler would go onto your dedicated site, which is listed here, here at abrigs.com slash UW. Uh, they would then put, answer four questions, uh, in which case it would come out with a requirements based upon the information that they responded to. At that point then, uh, they would fill out the forms, which are provided by the, Brig, the ABRIGS kit. Uh, they fill out the forms and then they would uh, ship them into a CIBT office. Uh, depending on the country, um, uh, some, some countries are jurisdictional, some countries aren't. So all the kits are updated with the information of where they need to send their information to along with their passport and any other supporting documentation. At that point then, we review the documents um, and make sure that everything's okay. If something is not okay, that is when we would go in and, and contact the traveler and say, hey, you know what, you forgot to sign your application or you forgot a, a, a section here that needs to be filled out. We'd work with the traveler, have them fill out the information and then get it back to us as well. We then take it to the consulate where they then hopefully um, grant the visa. That We then go and pick up the visa. We do yet another quality control check to make sure that the visa is accurate um, and that everything is consistent and then we ship it back to the traveler. So a very streamlined process um, so that to avoid the traveler having to go to the consulate and have to do any of that other things. They really just have to fill out the information and then submit it to CIBT, ABRICS. So I wanna kind of spend in the, in the few minutes that I have here left, uh, just kind of go over a little bit uh, in, in a little bit more detail here of the overall process flow that I just described. So as I said, you had a customized a kit, as you can see in the top right hand corner, it says the University of Washington uh, with your logo on there as well. On the left hand side are the uh, ABRIGS, so you know you're at the company that you're at. And then from there we have uh, tabs with the different services we offer. So you first, you know, first main tab is the travel visas. You can look into passports, we provide legalizations. And then services is another area where uh, we have a whole other slew of services. We can pr provide international driver's licenses, invitation letters. And so there are a lot of other ancillary services we can provide besides just a visa and passport. So I had said in the beginning of, of the process flow, these are the four questions you would, you, the traveler would answer. You know, do I need a visa? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, where you hold a passport from? the state of residence that you're, they're from, where they're going to, and the purpose of trip, okay? At that point, then they would click on check requirements, and this is the slide that would come up. And from there then, uh, it would tell you, yes, a visa is required for the trip. Just for the record, I prepared these slides um, quite a while ago, long before this whole <laughs> coronavirus thing happened, but uh, this is what would come up. You would have the option um, at the very bottom here, it says in any imp important information you'd want to know about, and then it gives you a very high level overview of all of the documents that would be required. You can click on that red button that says get my visa and begin your online order. Once the online order is completed, you, the traveler will receive an application kit, or will receive this email notification saying that an application kit has been emailed to them, and then it provides an or email order summary. Um, and at that point then, this is the email that would be received with the application kit. They would then fill out the application and then submit it 
with their passports and any other supporting documentation that is required of, from the traveler for the traveler for the consulate. And here is just a very brief, just br very brief overview of what the uh, application kit looks like. Again, if you see on the top right hand corner, it is customized with the University of Washington. It then goes over the type of visa that you required, the amount of entries that you're asking for, the validity. Um, China gives up to 10 years validity for U.S. nationals. On the right hand side, it's, you know, again, restates the traveler nationality, the state of residence, and then the account number. So, as I said that, and I know I'm a little bit short here on time, I simply just wanted to go over uh, what should your travelers and you expect from our program. Um, we are here to provide travel document solutions. Uh, we, off we offer friendly, knowledgeable staff to your, to your travelers where they can provide consistent information. Um, expert guidance, we believe we, we are the experts here and we are here to assist your travelers in making sure that uh, they are given the information that they need in a timely manner. Uh, order responses, order updates can be provided 24 hours, seven days a week online. Uh, so if they want to know what the status of their application is, they simply go to the dedicated portal that we just reviewed. And from there, then they would put in their order summary and some other information, and it would come up uh, with their order. Um, as I mentioned, it's very important when we receive the documents, both from the, from the traveler and the consulate, to do quality insurance. We review all the documents to make sure that they are accurate and then send them back to the traveler. And of course, probably from uh, where a lot of people like that the best is that there's a substantial discounted price for the University of Washington. The last slide I want to go over here, there are just some helpful hints uh, for uh, you and your travelers. One of the most important things is never keep an application on file requirements change at a moment's notice. So uh, it is always recommended that the traveler print out their, uh, get, start to fill out their application, print out their documents when they are about to submit them. They should not print them out, wait two and a half, three weeks and then submit them. Consulates will change requirements at a dime's notice. Our kits are always updated because we're always going to the consulate. Uh, so we always are providing that information. But if they print it out, wait a couple weeks, and then submit, there's a chance that they could have the wrong information and then they have to go through and do the application form again. So sometimes these application forms are a little bit tricky as it is. No need to have the traveler do it more than once. Very important, passports should have at least six months validity. If your passport is within six months of going being expired, in most countries, it is, it is expired. So it is really important that um, travelers get their passports, uh, get their passports renewed prior to the running into the six month validity. Processing times can be different based upon country, countries, jurisdictions, and nationalities. Not every two are different. Someone could be applying in San Francisco and New York, they could have the exact same itinerary, exact same trip, but they may be asked two different things from the consulates. The New York consulate for China and the San Francisco consulate for China ask sometimes different, have different requirements and different processing times. Remember the visas and passports are always issued at the consulate or the passport agency's discretion. It is always on a case by case basis. Um, and again, the last thing is, is just to provide, I provided you the telephone number and email services for your account, should you have any, you or your travelers have any questions. So hey, Greg, that, I'm gonna interrupt you for a second. You have um, yeah. a question. All right, perfect. It says, uh, hold on, let me. Um, are the CIBT services available on an as needed basis or does the traveler need to first set up an account? Uh, excellent question. No, if they go to the portal that I mentioned here, which is abriggs.com slash UW, um, it's on an as needed basis. You have, the University of Washington has an account, the traveler can access that, um, and then they get the discounted rates through uh, our relationship with the University of Washington. Great, thank you.
And the last slide here is just providing feedback. Uh, here's my contact information. Um, you know, please don't ever hesitate to contact me if there are any questions. Um, I also work with Teresa a lot uh, and Kelly. So, you know, you also feel free to talk to them and they can correspond with me as well. Um, but we truly value your business and we look forward to supporting, supporting you uh, for many years to come.